Today's episode is brought to you by West End, South Australia's most iconic beer. Now, it's a clean, fresh draft beer. There's nothing more local, nothing more South Australian than cracking a red tin. The last probably couple of years, I felt it really hard to come into the club and actually lead. That's the kind of place I was in mentally. Yep. No vulnerability, just I have to be perfect. Everything has to be done this way. Everything has to be done my way kind of thing. That is a tough way to live, isn't it? Oh, it's, man, it's an impossible way to live. Impossible. You can't do it and it is so draining. Well, that's the one and only Travis Boak, a boy from Torquay on Victoria's surf coast who has become the heart and soul of the Port Adelaide Football Club. He's an amazing player whose professionalism is legendary and he's been brilliantly consistent across 300 plus games. And don't worry, there's still plenty more football in him. Now, as good a footballer as he is, he's an even better bloke. His honesty and vulnerability is remarkable, and I can't wait for you to hear him open up in this chat. Now, this episode does talk about mental health, so if you have any concerns, please contact Lifeline on 13 11 14. Rightio, let's go. Welcome along to The Soda Room, a place where we get to know the real stories behind some of the biggest names in the game. It was like we had won the grand final. I just got some new boots. It was something yeah. special for me. Did you understand the significance of that moment? Oh, yeah. Nothing compared. That's what I thought I had to do as a leader. You've got the same undies on. <laughs> I've got exactly the same ones on. Travis Boak, welcome along, mate. I'm very, very excited to have you join us here in the soda room. <laughs> I'm excited to be in the soda room. I appreciate you uh, having me in, mate. Well, the soda room's a safe place. Yeah. So you can just come in here and have a chat. I'm you know? relaxed. I'm very relaxed. I wouldn't want a beer, though. Well, it's a judgment-free zone, too. <laughs> We get um, a couple in. You can't have any beers because <laughs> you've just wrapped up training. Okay. Um, and while we're recording this, this is a Wednesday, isn't it? It is a Wednesday. And you got footy on the weekend. Well, so, I suppose someone will find out. Well, Kenny let you have a beer. Well, We're being filmed too, we, actually. Yeah, okay, so he'll find out. Yeah, he probably would. Yeah, okay. Mate, so good to have you here. Now, you've just hit 34 years of age, or I should say instead of 34 years old, you're 34 years young. You've turned back the clock. You've got the, I think, the answer to the fountain of youth. Well, I'm trying to stay young. It's, mate, you are. It's creeping up on me, but we've got a pretty young group, so they keep yeah. you young. Yeah. And we've got a lot of pests at the club, uh, yes. the young boys, so they they definitely keep you young. So, But, yeah, I've managed to, to – <laughs> I don't know if it's avoid some of the things that, you know, you get to 30. Yes. Um, you know. Yep. People start settling down and kids and all that kind of stuff. But I'm uh, probably gone the opposite route and, and it's probably kept me a young, bit young. Well, I can remember, you're like <laughs> Benjamin Button, you're going in reverse. I can remember you're 30 when you turned 30 a yes. few years ago, you know, and your footy you was sort of ticking along and yep. suddenly you're four, le- four years later in the uh, form of your career, it's been... Mate, it's been an amazing last three or four years for you, I reckon. Yeah, it's been enjoyable. There's no doubt. And I think at the end of 2018 was, I felt like I was struggling a fair bit, yeah. definitely. Um, yeah. Footy-wise, mentally-wise to, you know, do I want to keep going? How am I going to keep yeah. going? Confidence levels of my performance was quite quite low at that stage. This is, and at the end of 2018 was six years of captaincy, you six gave it up, didn't you? Yeah. You so, made that call? Uh, it was a mutual call with Kenny. Yeah, yeah we, uh, we it was sort of at the end of the season. It might have even been before the last round and we sort of just chatted about, you know, what do you reckon, you know, post yeah. this year. Um, we both sort of kind of looked at each other and went, yeah, I think it's about time, you know, six yep. years. And it is like it's a challenging it's a challenging role and, and towards the end it, it got quite difficult for sure. Yeah. Uh, mentally, physically, it was just really, really draining. And I reckon the last probably couple of years, I felt it r- really hard to come into the club and actually lead. That's the kind of place I was in mentally. Yeah. A lot to do with, you know, we'll probably touch on some of this stuff, yeah. but, um, you know, having to be perfect all the time mm. as a captain and trying to control everything that I could as a, cause that's what I thought I had to do as a leader, yep. you know, no vulnerability, just, I have to be perfect. Everything has to be done this way. Everything has to be done my way kind of thing. That is a tough way to live, isn't it? Oh, it's man, an impossible way to live. Impossible. You can't do it. And it is so draining. And I knew none of this stuff at the time. And it wasn't until that conversation and, um, sort of, you know, we'll pass on the captaincy mm. and then. It wasn't actually that so much that actually freed me up, but the conversations that I had post that. Before we get to what freed you up, because this is what fascinates me about you, and this is why I love your story, Trav, is because of what you've been able to do. And, you know, you've had some bloody tough battles you've had to overcome. 
Are you happy just to go back a little bit? Let's yep. go back to little Trav in Torquay, living in one of the best places on the planet, the surf co- coast of Victoria, Perfect. just around the corner from Lawn. If anyone's listening and you've never holidayed down that way, Get down. Anglesey, you know, Apollo Bay, Lawn, best part of Australia. Don't come down to summer though because I'm usually there and it's way too busy. Yeah, it is, it is. <laughs> um, take us back to little Trav in Torquay. Yep. Can you remember the first time you played footy, you kicked the footy, you had a footy, or do you remember your first football? Um, yeah, it would have been a little soft Carlton, Carlton one, so I was a mm. Carlton supporter and we were just footy mad, my house. Mum loved her footy, dad was was footy mad and they were um, – they were – Carlton supporters and, and basically our whole family from there was Carlton. Even my cousins and everything were all yep. just Carlton supporters. And yeah, I had a footy pretty early on, I reckon. And I just remember the Oz kick days, uh, you know, starting out at Torquay and, you know, you go down there on a Sunday morning for, for a couple of hours and you come straight off and you go straight to the, uh, straight to the barbecue, sausage sizzle. Yep. And my dad uh, worked for a, uh, a company called TA Inkpen, which was a distributor for Lollies. Like all confectionery, for Nestle, Cabaret, Cabaret oh all that kind of stuff. So he'd bring down a heap of lollies. So your dad was like Willy Wonka? Oh, yeah, he was basically. <laughs> yeah, all the new stuff too. So it was, wow. yeah, somehow I didn't get fat as a Jeez. kid too. So it, was, it must have been all the sport I was playing. So straight after I was kicked, yeah, straight into the, yeah, into the lollies, into the sausages. Yeah, it was just footy, footy, footy constantly. Cricket in summer? Cricket in summer, footy in winter, and that was it. I didn't I didn't start surfing until I was about 17. I wish I started earlier because mm. it is a uh, tough sport to start mm. late. But, yeah, it was just cricket and footy. That was it. A little bit of basketball at school. Yep. Um, but as the boys at the club would say, I, I cannot shoot, so I didn't play that much basketball. Right. But, yeah, a lot of cricket. And I was actually more cricket than footy um, until I was about 16. Right. So Torquay Tigers, that's who the team was, wasn't it? And Torquay your dad, Tigers. your dad was a Torquay Tiger. Yeah, so dad played over 200 games for, for Torquay. Number 10? Um, number five. Was he number five? Number five. So number so five is my favourite number. Why are you, why do you wear 10 and not five? So when you get drafted into a into a club, you get, obviously there's some guys retire and, and numbers become available. When yeah. I got picked up in the end of 2006, 2007, we come to the club and I was the first pick. So I got first choice of numbers. And at that time, Lady was number of course. five. Brings Frank Bloody Lady took your number. Just retired, so number yeah. ten become available, and that was the lowest number right. out of the lot. So that's how I chose number okay. number ten. But it was quite funny. Then my mum's really good with numbers. She adds more together and becomes a meaning. And she's like, "Oh well, five for dad, five for you is ten. So then it become a pretty special number for me. So that's <laughs> how that's it's, good. Yeah. So that's how it's that's kind of actually pretty special. Good on your mum, Chicky. She's a she smart is, woman. She's all over it. So dad. Obviously, was a bit of a Tigers legend down Torquay. Yeah, he was. He was actually a footy legend, you know, all over the country a little bit. So he he played most of his footy in Torquay. Played up in Darwin a little bit, a little bit in Brisbane. So he he yeah he played kind of everywhere. He had a he had a, a wardrobe full of footy jumpers that he of the clubs he played for. And when you go down as like. 14, 15, 16, you go to training and even yep. local footy now, you wear whatever jumper you want. Of course. I was just rolling in all of dad's oh, jumpers, like yeah. just different colours, different yep. numbers and all that kind of stuff. But Torquay was was where he was a legend and um, where he made all his – And was that because of work he travelled? That's why he played at the different clubs or did he travel nah, this with was, footy? this was young. This is right. before – kind of before mum and dad were married. So his early days – uh, he he kind of just wanted to explore and, and play a bit of footy and travel around the country a little bit. And, and the greatest story that I remember from all of that, you know, was was actually the funeral, dad's funeral. This kind of sums who we sums up who mm. he was as a person. That we had the, the we had the the funeral at the Torquay Footy Oval. We just had some seats out at the wake. Is that what, yeah. you, is that what you call Afterwards, it? Afterwards, yeah. yeah. And there was over a thousand, two thousand people there that come Gee. to the funeral, all from around Australia. And all from the footy teams that dad played for. Right. Yeah. So that was really special. And hearing all the stories were all pretty similar yeah. on how caring and how giving he was as a, as a person. Yeah. And yeah, that was that was pretty special. But yeah, all the footy clubs he played for. So it was, it was nice. Well, the caring and giving side of it sounds like someone else we know, I think. And we'll get to that. <laughs> so you were young when dad got crook? I would have been about 14 when mm. um, we were sitting in the lounge room and mum and dad told us at the time. And uh, as, as most parents do, would probably try and protect yeah. Uh, the kids and don't tell the full story and mm. we just got told he was he had cancer and I think at that time I had no idea what that even kind of meant but mm. and uh, so he was just going in for treatment and, and we'd sort of hope for the best so it was kind of just as a kid we were like just go about our lives a little bit not knowing how bad it was and how old were you at that time I would have been 14 so you just assumed dad's going to get a bit of treatment and dad's going to be good in a few okay. months yeah so we didn't even if mum and dad told us what exactly cancer it was I probably was, still wouldn't have known at that, at that time yeah. And it was like a, it was in his stomach lining, which was which was really hard. You couldn't really operate on it, and yeah. he would have a lot of chemo and stuff. And during that period, it just 
he just got sick and lost a lot of weight and just and he had he had the beer gut, he had all that kind of stuff. He had all yeah. that going on. So he yeah, he became really skinny and as it, it was and we we're kind of just not knowing what what was going on a little bit. And some of those that was kind of the worst period. It was almost that was worse than him actually passing away, was those two years that he was sick. Did they give him a time frame? Uh, well, Early I on? think after mum sort of told us that he was given probably six months to live and he lived for two years. He fought for two years. Yeah, he fought for two years. So, which was, which is really, you know, now I look back on it and go, well, that's where I feel like I've got a lot of my drive and determination mm. from was actually from that. And you don't even know, but yeah, like he went through some horrible stuff. You know, the amount of times we had to call an ambulance for dad, it was, it was just horrend horrendous and you wouldn't, yeah, you wouldn't want to miss that, wish that kind of stuff on anyone. So during that time, because you got two sisters and you got mum, Chicky, yep. so essentially you become the man of the house. Did yeah. you did you feel that responsibility that you were the man of the house? At, and you're I, a kid. Yeah, I reckon I felt that for years past as well. And that's that's some of the struggles that I had to get get through. That you know I kind of had to be strong and I had to um, take care of of everything. And yeah, that was that was pretty pretty challenging. Um, so during that period, during those two years with your dad, were you, be as you were growing, were you becoming aware that it was a lot more serious than you'd originally thought? Uh, to be honest, I, I don't think so. I don't reckon until, until he went to hospital for the last time, we knew that he was going to die. You know, we just saw him getting sicker and sicker and still we're probably just hoping for the best. And I can't recall mum saying, you know, he's got this much time mm. left or, or whatever, but he just got really, really sick and you could just... Mm. Um, you could just see, and when everyone, anyone goes through that kind of treatment, you can tell that, you know, they're not well and just kills every part of your body as, as well as fighting the, the cancer. And it wasn't until the last time he kind of went into hospital and he was basically, um, non-responsive for, for a couple of weeks. And that was, yeah, that was the worst, worst memories that I've got of that whole period of, of not just sitting there and he can't talk to you, but he's still half awake. That's when I knew it was. He was going to pass away. Did you have a chance? I, so I, my parents are still alive. Yep. So I find it amazing to even understand and be empathetic to know what it feels like in that situation. When you knew that was happening with your dad, did, did, you, did you get the chance to sort of talk to him and tell him how you feel or do you sort of hold that back? Yeah, well, I remember and I reckon we all kind of got a chance to go in there and sit there and talk with dad and I remember – um you know, just holding his hand, sitting by the bed and just talking to him. And mm. I, I don't, I can't even really remember what I said mm. at the time, but yeah, it's, it, you get that chance. I mean, I was fortunate enough in a, mm. in a situation where a parent passes yep. away that I actually got to say goodbye, but it mm. still right. feels like you, right. you've got more to say, you know what I mean? Of course. And, um, you know, we've had, you know, Toddy Marshall at the footy club has lost both parents, which is, which yeah. is horrific, but you know, one you know, it was a heart attack, bang, straight away. You mm. don't get to say goodbye like that. It would yep. just be heartbreaking. And in a way, I was fortunate enough to say goodbye to dad, but there's still so many words that you wish you could mm. wish you could talk about. And then post that, it's there's just so much that you wish that they were still there, you know, getting drafted, conversations post-footy, even today, like, you know, how do you reckon I played, you know, how did I go here? Because everything growing up, my my junior footy was, was dad was there. He was coached for, for a lot of – for a lot of my footy and he was he wasn't you know one to sort of cuddle or he wasn't one to absolutely go off he mm. was very honest about mm. but he loved me and wanted me mm. to get better on that kind of stuff so it was what do you reckon here what do you reckon here mm. and and i recall a time this was after a cricket game i was playing for a uh, dowling shield which is yeah, such remember. a long representative yep. and it was under under 17s i reckon it is i wasn't i didn't have a great day bowling so i was a bowler back then right. and i quick. didn't have a great day try to be quick okay i opened up just, just mm. uh, try to send a few down. I didn't have a great day bowling and I wasn't too happy. So he, and dad was like, oh, well, let's go down the net straight after. And he was just there, put the cones out and just helped me straight after just, just to keep bowling overs, keep bowling overs. So he was just super supportive. So you miss that kind of stuff that yep. you, you know, you want to recall mm. after a game and talk, even just have a beer and all that kind of stuff. You were, so through that time and, and with your dad's passing, I, like you touched on, I could only imagine knowing what you're like and being the caring person you are, you would have looked after your sisters you would have looked after your mum no I tried doubt. to yeah um, I tried maybe. to and even even to this day I mean mum is just an incredible human and the way I look at it you know she's lost her life partner and that would just be horrible and then to take care of us three kids on her own and do basically everything you know Cass 
and myself were still going through school at that time. And then for me to then go into state and, sh and she still supported me through that and then support Cass through school and my older sister through what she wanted to do. It was just, man, she was just incredible. And I'm in debt to her for the rest of my life. There's no doubt. And, but even, yeah, my sisters are, um, you know, really, really special to me. And I guess being the brother of, mm. and my older sister's only, only a um, couple of years older than me. So I still feel like I'm older than her and yeah. I'll take care of her, you know, both yeah. of them. So that's kind of, yeah, the responsibility I think I've taken on, but I think that's just a brother thing and it's just love and, and try and try and look after him. And it, it's funny. So my younger sister, Cass, who's partner now is Anthony Beamers, used to play the mag, um, our Magpies in South Adelaide. Yeah, of course. Yeah. The he's first, a tough nut. He's a tough he's nut. A good player. <laughs> so he's a big boy and loves to, loves to have a little argument and a fight. Yeah. And we're actually really, really good mates now. Yeah. And the, <laughs> the first time we met Cass, I come home, it was probably my second year of footy. And I was home at the time and, and Cass brought BMO around. He'd, he'd already met mum. Mum already approved. Oh, she'd given him the thumbs up? <laughs> she'd already given him the thumbs up. Right. But hang on. And there's there's someone he has to pass first yeah. though, isn't there? To well, get this the is the relationship my, me and my sister have is, you know, if I have to give the approval first. Of course. Cass is always on my <laughs> side. And uh, so BMO, BMO came over and we sat on the couch. Cass and mum went into the kitchen, which was in the other room, not even right. the room. We sat on the couch for an hour. I didn't say a word to him, didn't speak to him. And then they left. <laughs> they left after. Now, did you did you do that because you were you didn't want a bloke I'm dating boss. your sister? Or did yeah. you do it just to, to sort of just to let him you're know. like a dog, you pissed on the ground and said, mate, this is my territory. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Like <laughs> I'm the boss here, like you have to right. to, to come through me kind of thing. Yeah. So they left, <laughs> walked out, and B BMO said to Cass, your brother's an arsehole. <laughs> And, uh, and Cass just said, well, if you don't like him, you can't be with me. And wow. then the next day we become friends basically really? from then. Uh, and so it was, yeah, that was, the, that was the story that's how they, be, they come together. But that's, you that, passed was the my, test. that was my role. Look after you played that role. And I'll, I'll do the same with my older sister. Bokey, I've got to ask then, you, you look after your sisters, you look after your mum. As a young guy, how were you looking after yourself? Did, did you know how to look after yourself? No. I think for me, once, once I got drafted, it was just all footy. It was all footy and all, all family and that was it. I didn't really understand, you know, any of my emotions, any of my feelings. Mm. I didn't really deal with anything of dad passing away until, you know, probably six, eight years later, eight or nine years later. So everything right. just became the harder I work, yep. the more I can just forget about all the rest, right? So that's kind of... You dealt with it? My, yeah, that's kind of how I dealt with it. And that just became who I was. And in the end, footy became who I was for a long, long period of yeah. time. Um, and that kind of ruined a few little relationships, I think. You know, my my sister and I were really close and then I had got drafted and we separated a little bit until I came back home and mm. sort of we'd be a lot closer and, and I didn't speak to my older sister as much. And I reckon that kind of affected those relationships a little bit because mm. I reckon I just closed off and and everything was just let's just focus in this small bubble of footy. Were you shattered when you got drafted away from home to a different state? Not really. Yeah, it was a, it was a funny one. I think I didn't I didn't really want to stay in Geelong as much as maybe go to Melbourne. Yep. So it was a, it was a bit of a, mm. a shift. And I reckon during that time I just really wanted to do my own thing in a way. Mm. And and I was just starting to grow up really really quick yep. and. And I wanted to just start my own kind of journey. And I think being, going to Adelaide was, was really special. But at the same time, as soon as I got drafted, I was like, well, I'll go back home in two years. Right. That was kind of how I felt. Yeah. And then it was two years after that. And then two years yeah. after that. You yeah. Know, and then Do you know, that I staying. honestly believe there's something about Adelaide. And I grew up in Melbourne and I came over here and yeah. certainly wasn't anywhere as good as you. And I got dumped within six months of coming with the Crows. <laughs> but- I thought I'll play a couple of years in the SNFL, then I'll go home. Yep. And then two more years, and then two more years. Yep. And, and now I've been here 30 years this year. Just talk but to But there's something about Adelaide, I reckon, if you can get through those first couple of years, yeah. it just becomes such a brilliant place to live and, yep. and grow, I reckon. It is. It's a beautiful place. And I think, because if you live in Victoria and you haven't been to Adelaide, it, you're like, I'm going to Adelaide. The backwater. There's a shell. Like, <laughs> yeah. who wants to go to Adelaide? And yeah. even people to this day who haven't been here are still, I'm yes. like, no, you actually need to come over and experience it because mm. it is a beautiful place. And I think for me, I hated Melbourne. It was too busy because yep. I grew up in Torquay. It was country. Um, so Adelaide was just a bigger, mm. bigger kind of Geelong for us. 
speaking of Geelong, so when Geelong come over yep. a while ago, a few years back, and they bring everyone, they bring the <laughs> cavalry and they walk through the airport. Remember all those shots? And I remember working and we had to go down there. I'm going, oh, God. <laughs> Were you, did you legitimately consider going home? I know you would have obviously missed mum and, mm-hmm. and all of that. Did it become a heavy decision? Every week my mind changed, yeah, during that year, I reckon. One week I was going, one week I was staying, and I just kept going back and forward, back and forward, and it was a really challenging year. And then I think, I don't know when it happened, maybe it was, a, it was towards the end of the year, I reckon. I don't know how many rounds yeah. left that I just felt like, no, I'm, I'm staying. And... I had the conversation with mom and she was she was happy for me to stay. She was always going to be happy but sad kind of thing. Mm. And just in my mind and the way I felt was like there is no way that I can leave this footy club right now. And because we were having the worst year, we'd, I mean, the last two mm. years we'd just been horrible. Mm. And it just felt cowardly to, to walk away from mm. this footy club uh, in the situation that was in. And I don't know if that come from, you know, mom and dad's values and – and the way, you know, dad fought through what he had, yep. I couldn't leave the club in the situation they were in and, and be proud of that or not have regret. So that was kind of the decision that I wanted to stay and Jacko stayed, Robbie and a few of us mm. stayed on and tried to, to, to change it around. But, um, yeah, that year was just up and down of my decision to go, to go back or stay. You talked about through all this time with your footy, you played great footy, won best and fairest, all Australian, all this sort of stuff. And then you get to this position probably towards the end, what, 2017, 2018, around that captaincy yep. time. <clears throat> yep. And you said that's when you what you started to really, I suppose, think about your dad's situation, how you'd been dealing with it and all of that. Yeah. What, so it was- What happened there to sort of start that process? 2000, it would have been around 2016, I started to talk about dad stuff with a psychologist, a guy that come into the club. It was pretty intense. Some of the stuff that we're sort of talking about and how he was able to get a lot of it out of me because it was pretty deep. And that actually got a lot of emotion out, a lot of, a lot of tears. I reckon I, before that I hadn't, I cried maybe once since Mm. dad passed away. Really? Not because I didn't want to, but I just couldn't. So it was just all buried. So those, the sort of time you saw him for those weeks in the hospital, funeral, all of these moments. I reckon. I cried at the funeral for a yeah. bit and then post that, just, I just, I don't know. I just, and I think that's where the footy stuff, I was just so focused on all this that I just forgot about all it's my almost like a, all my maybe feelings. like a survival mechanism. Basically. You know, to yeah. protect your feelings and to protect your vulnerability. Well, basically that's what it is. And I've got a, a, a picture in my mind of when it happened was when I left the hospital knowing that dad was passing away basically the next day that you put an armor up of I'm never getting hurt again. And, wow. you know, whether that's being, trying to be perfect, whether that's trying to numb it, yep. all that kind of stuff. And it wasn't until about, you know, I started talking about it a little bit, but I still didn't know how I was protecting myself or why yep. I was protecting myself until end of 2018, started 2019. I had a, um, uh, a chat with a guy who I work with now, Ben Crow, who, who looks after Ash Barty yeah. and he's a pretty impressive guy, isn't he, Ben he is, Yeah. So he kind of introduced me to all this vulnerability and Brene Brown stuff yep. and all the books. And I hadn't really read too much before that, but then I started she reading- talks about shame and things. And everything, mate. Yeah, and, right. And that's when I started to get a, an understanding of where my thinking was and where I was putting, you know, a lot of my built up emotion and, and stuff that finally I was able to, you know, get a, a, an understanding of it, but then work on it. And, and to have, you know, him in my corner and, and, and other people at the club in my corner to then actually understand it. And a lot of mine was just trying to be perfect all the time. That's how I protected myself from being hurt. Can I, God, I imagine it's taking you a long time and you said a lot of work, but what was it? Was there, was there something? Was there a, a technique? Was there advice that he gave that made you sort of start to understand yourself? <laughs> it's, it's quite funny. Like anyone could have said something. And because it's just a small line that he said to me yeah. that, that kind of just opened up everything and completely changed it. And all of it, it's literally like I just felt this whole weight just come off my shoulders. And he said, it's okay to be you. That's all he said. Like during conversation, and he said yeah. that to me and I was like, hang on, what? I can be me. He said, I can be me. Mm-hmm. And I was just like, wow, um, that's kind of what I wanted to hear. But I didn't understand it until probably now. So he said, it's okay to be you. Yeah. 
And that's that, that to me then was like, hang on, what, all that stuff that I was trying to be perfect and had to play well at footy to be good and um, do all this stuff to be a good human. Well, I can just be me and like, and make mistakes and be vulnerable and all that kind of stuff. And I'm still okay. Like that's how it all that was. It. That was it. And, and from that moment, it just, I went out on a footy field thinking nothing bad could happen. I play bad. Doesn't matter. I've, I've still played well. Like what, that's how it felt. What was your mindset before that? If you played, let's say you had a game that wasn't up to your usual standard. Oh mate, going into the game, I was just so anxious, which when, you know, when, when you feel like your worth is on the line through what you do, mate, your body just kind of shuts down. Everything yeah. tenses up. So you go into a fight or flight basically. Yes. So you're in protection mode because yeah. you're trying to protect yeah. your worth basically. So yeah. you go in the footy field and everything yeah. just feels so uh, heavy and yeah. structured and you can't make good decisions because you're literally trying to make the perfect decision all the time to stop yourself from being hurt. That's kind of what it felt like. And I, that was me for like 13, 14, I had some really good years and – you know, but that was, I think, just confidence through playing good footy. Because you still had those same feelings. Yeah. But you were still able to overcome them because of confidence. Yeah. And we were playing well. So I was right. like, yeah, I'm, I'm the man, like playing well kind of thing where if if things had gone bad, it might have been a different story, yeah. which the next few years we were starting to play bad. So I was bad. I was captain of that. So I was bad. Like that's the kind of language that you tell yes. yourself. So then that stress, I imagine – brings out those issues that have been hidden by confidence and success. Exactly. Exactly. Wow. So you, your confidence gets hit so right. bad because it's attached to what you do. Right. So if you're right. bad playing a bad yes. game, confidence goes down, you play a good game, confidence goes up. So yep. it's just like a roller coaster. So you, it's, it's external reinforcement is helping you derive who you are. That's kind of what, where I was, where uh, yeah, um, yeah. post that was okay to be me. My confidence level stays at a, at a, at a level because it's like, well, I'm okay how I am. Yep, and then your performance confidence can sh can shuffle. Yes, but if you do the work, you can be confident going out there, going, "Well, I've done what I can control. I can go out there and play. Whatever happens, that's out of my control." So that statement from Ben Crow is almost like a switch was flicked. Switch, yeah, just completely changed, and that's what it felt like. Literally, the conversation was felt like, and you can talk to a few other people who've had conversations with yep. you. It's just one line, bang, just changes a few things, and it's it's pretty special to to start to understand this kind of stuff and the reading that I've had through, you know, Daring Greatly, Gifts of Imperfection, stuff that Brene Brown talks about, mm. just a big eye opener to a lot of stuff that is going on in the world right now and especially during COVID yep. where, you know, and I found it out a little bit Well, I had COVID this year mm. for a week, I was stuck in isolation. Yep. The start of that week, I felt amazing. By the end of the week, I felt like shit. Yes. Like I was just away from everyone disconnected from everyone. Yep. Could only imagine what some of the people in Melbourne all yeah. over the world had gone through through that period. 100 plus days, wasn't it? Was yeah. It? Like that is a, a big challenge because, you know, connections while we're yep. here. When you talked about, you know, you did the work and, and you did that once you realised that, what, what is that? Is, it, is that reading? Is that listening to podcasts? Is that going through exercises? What, what sort of stuff yeah. do you do to do that? You know, for someone listening in now and they go, and I can understand that whole feeling of perfection. And I remember... It, Seeing Ben Crow, he re he said something about you first have to accept that you're good enough for yourself yeah. before you can even enjoy your world, which is similar to what you said. Yeah. And I remember looking at that and I thought, well, I've spent pretty much my entire life thinking that I'm not good enough yeah. and trying to do things better and better and better and yeah. better till you can be recognized as a good person. And it's, mate, it's bloody tiring. Yeah. It's bloody hard to live Hor like that. Horrible space to be in, isn't it? Yeah. Well, basically how you see yourself is how you see the world. It just, yep. you get, yeah. you get reminders of it all the time. Yep. And that's and just, essentially, <clears throat> that's just how it is. Did you, you find that it's almost other people's view that you're almost looking at their acceptance to tell you what you're like. Basically. Well, you're looking for external validation because you won't give it to yourself. So as soon as you start rejecting yourself, start, you know, not validating your whatever, Yep. Everything has to be external. So that's why we care so much about what other people think. I want to ask you, to, at those times before this this change has taken place, tell me about the self-talk to yourself, yep. like your, your internal dialogue. Was it harsh? Oh, it was horrible. It was horrible. Like everything, and, you know, I thought that just would make me better. Yeah. Like this is not good enough. Okay, let's continue yep. to improve. Where, you know, it was all based on perfection, but healthy striving is is actually a good thing. You know, it's yep. about improving yourself, continue to get better. Perfection is, is all about what other people think. And yeah. you're only doing it to protect yourself from 
the those opinions people. of others, right? So it's so heavy and so draining. And so I just trained harder and harder because I thought, oh, I'm just not fit enough yet because all yes. this weight, right? Yeah. Just heavy. And then you release that and it's like, and that's why I feel younger now than I probably yeah. did when yeah. I was captain because of all that shit that I've got rid of. The, the, the football that you've played over those years since, you know, 18, 19, honestly, it, that makes so much sense watching you play. Yeah. It's, Do you know um, what I mean? Like, you, you don't play a bad game. <laughs> Played a few. No, but you know what I mean? <laughs> you, the consistency in your yeah. game, I reckon, is brilliant. And I get a real joy watching Port Adelaide because, you know, I've been fortunate enough to know you for a long time. No, I appreciate that. That I can watch and go, it's almost like I can tick the box watching you going, I know Bogey's going to have a good game today. <laughs> because, and I, I wasn't exactly sure how you got to that place, but that yeah. makes so much sense. Yeah, it was... It's a, it was a, it was a good place to finally get into. And, and right now it's still, and I, I don't think it ever ends. Like it's a continued yeah. journey, but there's definitely times where you, you feel yourself going back into a, that old self, Yeah. but you catch yourself and you're like, yes. okay, well, this is the thinking that I got to. Okay. Now I just need to change that. I'm yep. in the perfection state. Okay. How do I change that? Well, I need to be open to all yeah. this kind of stuff. And, and, and that, I think understanding that whether it's happened after three weeks and then I'm my form might have dropped a little bit. Okay, well, what's going on there? And a lot of my reviews now aren't actually around the stuff that I do in the game, but actually how I feel about right. what I did in the game. Does that make sense? Like yeah. how I'm feeling in that space. It does. If I'm going ch chasing kicks and I feel like I have to get possessions, I have to do this, I have to do that. Okay, that's not the space I want to be in. Why am I in that space? Yep. You can check that during a game almost now. I can now, yeah. Wow. Yeah, so it's, it's a lot better in game than it used to be. And that's, and that's as part of the other stuff that I've done with, with Nam around the breathing and getting back to being centered and present. So a lot of breathing stuff actually helps you during that, during that state. Cause yep. you're still under pressure and under pressure, you, you, I can revert back to the old self or I can stay yes. where I want to be. And it's yep. just my decision yes. basically. Um, but if I'm, my breathing's better and I'm more present, then I'll yes. be able to make better decisions. Yep. To actually in the moment. go into it, yeah. In so I've zone. had games where I've had really poor first quarter and then reset and come out really well, or I've had a really good start and then I'm like, "Oh, I'm on for a big day. Here. Let's go after it," and then it goes down because you know you start chasing a little you got bit. Got distracted, right? yeah. You oh, get distracted. Yeah. So that's just where you know you got to continue to to reassess in games and go back to your focuses and all that kind of stuff. But if you're in a better space of not, I don't have to be perfect. Yes, so I'm going to make mistakes. That's yes. cool then, you know, you're a lot better off. And that, that's anything, you know, that could yeah. be, you know, being a nurse, being a lawyer, being whatever, you know, it's, it's all, what you do is not who you are. And the more yeah. we can understand that, the better at what we do will be, if yes. that makes sense. Yeah, it does. Yeah. yeah. It's a fascinating insight. That's, yeah, but it's, do you know, <laughs> when you explain it like that, it actually seems very logical. Yep. And you think, well, why doesn't everyone understand that? Yeah. Well, it's, like you, like I understand it. Like, well, I'm more understanding of it, but it's yeah. still a challenge. Uh, you yeah. know, it's a continued, yes. to continued process. But yeah. it, it all comes back, I think, to understanding who you are. So, tell me how all of that happened and occurred, and then were you were able to then use that to understand your dad and what happened with you during that time? Yeah, I think another part of this is gratitude. So, I'd Pep stay with me for I reckon he lived with me for Sam about Pell Pepper. yeah, Sammy yeah. Pell Pepper for about four years, I um, reckon. And over that time, we got to get, you know, know each other really well. And he shared his story about his dad and, and all that kind of stuff. And, and, and practicing and starting to understand what gratitude was and hearing more and more stories of how other people's relationship with their dad. So mm. post dad passing away, it was, if someone had a bad relationship with their dad, yep. I'd be so angry at that person. It's like, you should be so happy that you have a dad yeah. and you get to share all this stuff with them, right? Where now I'm like... You, you start to hear other stories and, you know, some people have had abusive dads or some people have lost their dads younger or some people, um, you know, haven't had the, haven't been fortunate enough to have a supportive dad. Mm. And I was like, oh my God, I was so lucky to have the dad I had for 16 years, yeah. you know, and, yeah. and my whole, my whole outlook on dad passing away had changed. I miss him every day. I wish he was here, but I was so lucky to have him. And the support he gave me, the guidance he gave me for 16 years. Some people don't get that. And, and that's the whole, you know, gratitude things. It, it can change the way you look at the world. So essentially, uh, we're talking about the, for want of a better term, the, the switch being flicked. Yep. 
that enabled you just to see all of that completely differently from a different angle? Completely differently, mate. And and then all the stories start changing, you know, rather than seeing, you know, the hospital bed and, and the ambulance and all that kind of stuff, which is which was the latter part of it and, yep. and probably where my anger goes mm. and and mm. guilt, shame, all that kind of stuff. I start seeing kicking the footy in the backyard, playing cricket in the backyard, early memories of, you know, helping dad, wow. you know, working in the backyard. And all that they'd kind been of stuff suppressed. Changed. Yeah, like stuff that I had, I'd forgotten about started coming up, you know, and all because I just started to to delve into, you know, the the pain a lot more and yep. and how I was actually feeling and and that kind of just yeah opened up new new doorways of new new memories and stuff like that and then just changed how I saw it, which was really special. Yeah, you're 34 years of age, and you have that understanding perspective already. <laughs> Mate, I'm 50, me. right? I'm telling you. <laughs> Um, and I still have struggles, you know, like you're yeah. saying with it, trying to be perfect and, and battles with depression and all that. And I look at it and I just think that's one fantastic thing you have for the rest of your life now mm. is the ability to have that really great perspective. And that change in perspective must just invigorate you and excite you about life. Well, that's, that's what changes the most, I think, your motivation, your energy to want to go do things because you've got a different perspective. Like in terms of footy, my perspective was, shit, I have to play well to be, to be well. So yeah. that was my perspective on it. You change that to, okay, let's go have a crack and have fun and see what happens. Yes. <laughs> oh, shit, let's go have a crack. And good stuff, happening. And then good stuff just happens and like the confidence builds because of that. And it's, you know, it's the same with, with, with dad, like I changed my perspective on that. I just saw all the good stuff and I wasn't... You know, I got angry that he left. It was not yeah. his fault, but I was angry that he left. Yes. And then I just started seeing all the good stuff. Yeah. And and then I think that you can then help others in that, you know, in that space as well because you you come from a different, you've come from a different perspective. You're not, you're not as angry and you don't have that, that guilt and that kind of stuff as much. Yes. You're just, you Resentful. Uh, yeah, all that, all resentful, all that kind of stuff. You talk about helping others. I know you, you said you had Sam Pepper living with you for four or so years. I know you've had Mitch Georgiades at times in your <laughs> for place. two weeks he was there. Yeah, well, I'm sure you would have had an impact on him. But <laughs> with those guys, I almost sort of get the feeling from the way you talk about it and, and seeing you around them that it almost feels like you have a bit of fatherly feel around them, if that makes sense. Yeah, from watching you, maybe, maybe I do. That might be without even realizing. Really, yeah, without even realizing. But it's just been really enjoyable, and they might keep me young too. That might be mm. part of it. But it's just really enjoyable getting to then part of why I love to understand what who I am and and my journey and my story and and changing the perspective mm. is then I can help someone else yep. on that journey. And you know that's that's been really special to then share it with others and whether that's through footy and performance through what I've learned yep. or, you know, the, the mind and, and mm. that kind of space. And I've been fortunate enough to also, you know, mentor Connor and, and Zach over the last couple of yep. years and, um, you know, their super talents with, with a great attitude to being mm. a great professional and being able to share the advice that I've mm. learned, you know, off the field as well as then implementing it on the field has mm -hmm. been really special. So yeah, I don't know if it's so much a, a fatherly figure, but that, yeah, it's it's it could be. Do you know one thing from from listening to this that I reckon is just brilliant is that you've had the chance to have this new perspective while you're still able to play. Yeah. And you didn't, you know, you're not 38 and retired and then you start to understand that perspective because you can actually put it into play. Yep. In, I mean, obviously you've got so much more to do in your life, but right now, with footy, you can put that mindset into play playing footy and the results are brilliant. Yeah, well, that, and that's like, because I love footy and I want to, and I'm really, really competitive and I'm really driven. So mm. for me, it's about reaching my potential. And if I had have, you know, retired it in 2018, it would have been so much left, right? Yeah. But being able to change that, you know, going through that period of change at the end of 2000, 2019, I was just like, oh, I'm so ready. Like yeah. I have that much left. Yep. So that was really that was really cool to then change and then go out there because there was there was still a lot of stuff written about me that you know I'm done, yep. I don't have much left, all that kind yeah. of stuff, and I was just like, oh. well, you can flip the bird door. In those my mind, I, I was like, I'm going to go prove me right, you know, not prove yeah. them wrong, go prove me right because I feel like I have so much left, and um, you know, because I, I hadn't reached my reached my potential yet, and that was off the back of this stuff holding me back, yep. and it wasn't until I was able to mm. release that that I could go out there and do it. Now that you look at this in hindsight, what did dad teach you? 
What did you learn from him from the, the years that you had him and the years that you haven't had him? Because it I, sounds like he's still taught you a lot, oh, a lot in this time now. Yeah. And I think, you know, come, a few of the values that I've learned from dad and also mum, mm. you know, the whole caring side and, and, and being kind and, and, and also valuing everyone as equal, I think yeah. is a, is a really, really important one. There's no, mm. no one's above or below anyone. Mm. And, you know, mm. dad was always that kind of person, mum, exactly the same. But I think, you know, the one thing that he taught me from probably just what he went through with his treatment and, and cancer was was drive and, you know, the, his ability to to battle through something that should have killed him six months for two years mm. because, you know, he wanted to spend more time with his family. Mm. I think that just, mm. um, you know, was instilled in me. I don't think before then, uh, even though I was still pretty young, I didn't have that drive. So now when I face challenging situations, it it's, you know, there's a fork in the road. Which way am I going here? Well, yeah. I've been taught one way. Let's yeah. let's let's go, you know, down that road of, of challenging myself and continue to grow. And your mindset, I could imagine, is I've got this. Yeah, like yeah. Same I with think, footy. Let's see what I can do now. I've, now I'm in that mindset. Yeah, and I think that's, you know, you go back to the other stuff. Well, yeah, let's see how we go. But, oh, I could fail. I could make a mistake. Or, mm. you know, what will people yep. think? That could hinder it a little bit. Yeah. Where now it's let's go this way. Hey, I might fail. I might make a mistake. People yeah. might not like it. Doesn't yeah. matter. Where yes. what journey am I going on? Yeah. It's not about anyone else but my journey. Yeah. So I'm I'm probably connecting more to those values now than I ever yeah. have. Boker, you seem far more emotionally intelligent beyond your years and you should be at thirty four <laughs> or thereabout. Seriously. No, I've, um, I've, I've learned a lot, but I've what an amazing so um insight. And but thank you so much for sharing a lot of that because it's intensely personal, but um, what, yeah, it, it just sounds like an amazing mental journey you've gone through. Yeah. The thing that I look at is you obviously played fantastic footy. The mindset you talked about, how the hell did you play so well yeah. carrying those sort of burdens and that weight on yourself? I think a lot of it got me – what got me through was actually the training. Like I've, I've – from early days, I just – love to train and, and mm. want to get better. Like I, I came to the club, I wasn't fit. Like, I, well, not to where I am now. Like we did beat tests and I was horrible. Yes. Um, we did 3K at the time. I was, I was no good. But I just learned how to train hard and I, and I really enjoy it. Yep. And I think that whole perfectionism and that protection, you know, to a point was, was helpful because it actually taught me to just keep going and going and going. And that, so I was putting my body to a limit but in a way of protection. So I learned a bit from that. And I think that's what got me through a lot of it. And then it, it yeah. come to a point where it was, this is just too much. And, yeah. you know, the last, it was probably 16, 17, 18, become really hard yeah. to play, to play free. Mm. I was playing um, and I still had some pretty good games in amongst those mm. years, but never as consistent. I fumbled a lot more. You know, I was never as clean as, as mm. probably, you know, what I am now yep. based on the fact that I cannot make a mistake. Yeah, I have right. to be perfect. And there's just that anxiety and that tension that yep. you carry that everything was just this one outcome, nothing else. Yeah. So you're not open to anything. So, but yeah, I think a lot of my training got me through that. And then, you know, post 2018, I, I, I've, I still train probably as hard. Mm. I'm definitely probably a lot more open to different stuff mm. and to learn and grow in different ways, mm. but it doesn't weigh me down. Mm. It doesn't weigh me down. I'm a lot more mm. freer mm. in most of my games. Mm. Not all my games because yes. there's still challenges, um, yep. but I'm, I'm able to re reset. But yeah, most of my games, I'm a lot freer. While you're talking about all those things and obviously the ability to impart knowledge and support the younger guys, have you thought about being a dad yourself? Have I'd you thought to. about what you'd be like yeah. as a dad? Well, I'd, I'd love to. It scares me a little bit because I'm I'm starting it a little bit older and I haven't found a connection with anyone, mm. a partner yet. So that does at times scare me. The more I try and force that, the worse it gets. So yeah. I understand that, you know, and that's probably another part now that I've got to start to open up to and, and not protect myself from being yeah. hurt, someone leaving me or not yeah. liking me, whatever it is. So that's a whole other part that I probably haven't put as much time into as I have in in the whole yep. you know performance space. But I'd love to be with dad more than anything. Yeah. So um, hopefully, hopefully one day soon. 
Well, I when I find again, not just random. No, well, <laughs> well, that's the other thing. Too. You know, when you when you're looking or you're searching, you never find. No, you got more chance of bumping trolleys in a supermarket yep. when you're not looking. Yeah, than you have exactly. going flicking. I don't know. I'm too old to know, but flicking right or left or whatever they do on those. <laughs> apps. Hey, I'm, no, no, no I, but you, you know what I mean. You, you start think, chasing it, so everything yep. becomes. Oh, I have to get yeah. this. Have to get this. So you blocked out everything. Yes. You know, or well, you might be. This girl has to be this way, so you start yes. chasing that. Where someone you're way more connected with. Do you know, I there. just had a thought. Then you talked about that, and you know, one day being a dad, I'm thinking uh, it, there'll be a few people listening to this. You might start getting all these little DMs slipping into your <laughs> social media, going, "Hey, Trav, I'm here. You interested well, in a date? I've got to look at them. I've got to be open to it, huh? <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, mate, I had my first child at 41. Oh, so, right. okay. Yeah, you're 34. You got don't, plenty of time. Don't worry, and and they keep you young. Well, mum's mum's the one pressuring us. Yeah, she wants grandkids. Right. <laughs> Elder sister hasn't had kids. No, nah, no. Nah. So she's uh, wow. nah, she's single as well. well and my younger sister has been with BMO. Yeah. They're um they're getting married next year. So oh great. Um, that's the start of it. And yes, that'll be probably the first ones. Will you will you say something at the wedding after the fact you wouldn't talk to BMO for a whole night on the couch? Do you reckon <laughs> well, you'll actually? I'll bring that story up. <laughs> I hope I get to talk. I'm yes. not sure yet. So I a very special moment. Uh, not long ago, it was a few few weeks ago now. Cass asked me to walk her down the aisle, which is which is really special. Yeah, obviously the dad does it, and I wasn't sure how that kind of works if it's mum or whatever. And yeah. she asked if I'd uh, yeah be the brother of the bride and walk her down the aisle. So that was a really special moment. Wow! Uh, so I'm looking forward to that. So mate, that's amazing. I'll stay off the beers as, yeah. as much as I can before then. And, and then, then just and, uh, as you hand her over at the altar, you just give, give him a, a little look and just give him that little reminder <laughs> of what remember? it was like on the couch. I might give him the silent treatment <laughs> for, you know, the whole day leading yeah. up to it or something. <laughs> oh, that's brilliant. Are they getting married in Torquay? No, it'll okay. be over here. Okay. Uh, over here. So they've they've settled over here now, yeah. which is good, but um, they've got a lot of family and, and yep. of friends really over here. Um, and then the family will come across, which yep. is not a, it's not a bad drive. It's about eight hours. So oh, mate, it's fine. They'll cruise across, which would be nice. So. Uh, mate, again, thank you. I think that vulnerability, and I, I love that people feel like I'm getting this sense that hopefully the world feels like everyone's starting to open up a little more. Yeah. And, you know, show people who you really are. Because, like you said, it doesn't really matter what anyone thinks. As long yeah. as you know that, what do you say, you, you're good enough or. It's okay know? to be you. And I think that's that's the whole thing. And I think more and more people now are starting to talk about it. And it's not only talk about it, but understand it, yep. right? And I think oh, someone's it's, it's on Instagram somewhere. Mm. I saw it. It's And what kind of depression is, in a way, is, mm. is you need deep rest. That's mm. kind of what, mm. that's what it was. And then yeah. rest from the character you've been trying to play for so long. Mate, rest from, you know, for 30 years I've yeah. battled it. And rest from the, the, the things and the voice and the stuff you say yeah. to yourself, it's tiring yeah it's bloody hard well you were playing that perfection character for so long yeah that it just finally yeah. drains you you got to take that mask off and it's only been probably the last six months when i've been able to step back from yeah you know working 12 14 hour days when you can stop and go why do i feel shit yeah there's got to be a reason and yeah. you know it was reading one of ben crow's things and it, it said you are enough yeah like you're saying that you, know, you can take that thing. mask off you can yeah you can be open to you yep. know to all these things that will hurt but yeah. that's that's part yeah. of life, you know. And and there's a, a line in Man's Search for Meaning. Have you read that book? No. Um, well, apparently you don't have to. You just read the first line, which is that's enough. Yeah, life is difficult. Once you accept life is difficult, life is no longer difficult. So it's about acceptance. That's a good point. You know, and once yes. we start accepting that, you know, we are enough, and accepting that things will hurt, and, and we are happen, imperfect. That's okay. Um, That's actually a good point. It is. That book, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> There's a bit of a spoiler. You don't need to buy the book. <laughs> That's what I got told. You don't need to read the book. You just read the first line. And that's it. So. It sounds like you've learned everything you need from that line anyway. <laughs> yeah. um, Bucky, a couple of things I want to ask because uh, I'm conscious of your time. Bucky, Childhood Cancer Association, you've done some wonderful stuff over the years with it, you continue to, and particularly now there's a beautiful painting of you getting around in Adelaide in our Spirit of SA exhibition. What was it, obviously, besides the obvious connection with your dad and cancer, but why is it so important to you? Yeah, well, it all kind of started, I think, like 12 years ago now, I think it's been. So it's been a, 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 um, a good little journey. But, yeah, why it started and why it's important to me, basically, so when dad was sick, we were in and out of hospital all the time, and it was the most horrible experience you could you could ever imagine. Mm. You know, we were sitting outside his room when he was really sick, and there was, like, one chair for three of us, and it was just, it was just horrible, and that's all we had, just us mm. family together. 
So then I got drafted and I wanted to, I think it was probably, yeah, my third year, maybe second or mm. third year. My mentor at the time was the governor, Kevin Scarce. And yep. um, we sat down and chatted and I said, look, I want to get involved in a charity, uh, something involved in cancer because that's, you know, what I've been through. And he's like, I hey, gave me a few different ones and I wanted one that, that I could help grow and mm. that, and, and at that time, childhood cancer was one that didn't get any, still don't get any government funding. And yep. so that's how I, I sort of got involved at the start. And we sat down and I said, look, I'll, what I want to do is not only raise money, raise awareness, mm. but more than anything, I want to be more hands-on with the kids and their yep. families in hospital. And so why it's important to me is because of how hard it was for me going through hospital and it was for my family mm. to try and take away some of that pain and toughness that, mm. that it is for them being in hospital, whether they're going through chemo, whether they've had surgery, whether they've been sitting in there for a little while, mm. recovering. If I can go in there for, you know, an hour and then spend five minutes, 10 minutes with, with each of the kids within the ward to take away some of that, their thoughts on what mm. they're actually going through, then, you know, hopefully I can put a smile on their face. And, mm. and that was the whole reason behind it. Unfortunately, over the last you know, three years with COVID, not being able to go into hospital, it's been a little bit more of a challenge in that aspect. So I'm hoping to get back in pretty soon. Hopefully the rules are starting to change mm -hmm. and I can get back into hospital. But that was why it was so important to try and actually take away some of that pain that they're going through uh, yeah. being in hospital. And, you know, whether it's cancer, whether it's whatever, being in hospital is not easy. And the people within the hospital are amazing. Like what they do mm -hmm. for for the people that are sick and, and going through stuff mm. in there is incredible. But if I can go in there and try and take away some of that pain for, for five minutes, mm. kick the footy, sign an autograph, mm. have a laugh, yep. you know, it's, it's pretty special. But in the end, I walk out of the hospital feeling so much better because of what they've given me, you yeah. know, it's not actually about what mm. I've given them and uh, their stories, mm. their inspiration, the smile on their face when they've got cords coming out of them. Yeah, yeah. It is, mate, it yeah. is so inspiring. Yeah. It's a hard place to, to visit, but it's yeah. also a very inspiring place to visit when you come out of the uh, out of the out yeah. of the hospital. Well, I think, mate, not only just doing that, they are a great organisation with the support they provide for families. And you, know, you look at people <coughs> on their board like Chris Hartley, the yep. president, and Ben Mead, and I think Glenn Hordaker. They're all dads yep. who have been through and used the support of childhood cancer, yeah. and it's like, well, they've helped me so much. I'm now gonna help that organization yeah. and that's what I think they're just brilliant because they do so much um, and the people doing it know exactly what they're dealing with like you exactly with how you know how to deal with it yeah exactly they've all got they've all got their own story and mm. and within that they're really really good people and they want to help mm. you know and and that's what that's what a charity is all about yeah. and they are just so incredible in that and not only do they help you know the kid going through the, the challenging times through you know the support that, that they can give them, but also the the family members, you know, through counselling and and all that kind of stuff is just just incredible. And yeah, very lucky to actually be there and mm. and get to work with some of the people at the at the CCA. They're just yeah, incredible. Well, I've seen the stuff you do, mate. It's it's absolutely brilliant. Obviously, your, your dad Roger, you've gone with the Rogers Undies, and we've seen yeah. some great stuff with that <laughs> over the years. Uh, beyond just the website with you standing there in your jocks with no top on, looking magnificent, but the Rogers Undies are terrific. They're going well, and you've done some great fundraising over the years. You know, with childhood cancer with that. Yeah, I've been um, you know fortunate enough to work with yourself and working with childhood cancer mm. and some stuff like that. But yeah, so it all started wow, like four years ago now, maybe yeah. four or five years ago. Uh, and I've always wanted to get into, you know, some sort of fashion and everyone was kind of doing jumpers and clothes, like t-shirts yep. back then. And so what about underwear? Like maybe there's a space and, you know. Everyone's got to wear them. Everyone's got to well, wear them. I was kind of, of a bit over buying them because they, yeah. they weren't cheap. Yeah. So I was like, let's, let's look down that space. And at the time yep. it was my, um, my cousin and, and her and his wife, who was on dad's side. Yep. We, uh, who she worked at Rip Curl at the stage. Yeah, so she yeah. had a few connections there with supplies and that kind of stuff. Yeah. And that's how it all started. And uh, we started getting samples back and all that kind of stuff. And and that's how it, how it all kicked off. Yeah. So to this day, uh, my sister now will start getting more involved. Um, yeah. So my cousin's going to go out and, and she'll yep. get more involved. And, and we're starting to to look to do. So we've taken a little bit of a break to now start doing hopefully a, more ra a, a different range, yep. some different stuff, and then work into some clothes. Which Where can people get them from? So you jump on uh, rogersunderwear.com.au right. uh, or on our Instagram, which is Rogers Underwear. What about, you know, before we started recording this, I went to the toilet and I didn't even think about it. But <laughs> as I 
went to the toilet, I looked down and guess what I'd put on this morning without even knowing? You put them on. Roger's undies. Right. What colour you got? I think I've got the green. Got the like, greens. The greens are nice with the black band. Yeah. Oh, you know what? I'm wearing oh, exactly the same ones. Have you got the same ones. undies on? <laughs> <laughs> I've got exactly the same ones on. Have you really? Yeah. Do you I'm go gonna... the briefs or the trunks? Uh, trunks. Yeah, I don't what? go trunks. Briefs are the, like, you honestly have to try them. No. Like, they are the best Do you ones. wear, like, jock Proper briefs? triangle ones, yeah. No. No, like, have you tried them? Never. I haven't worn briefs since I was in right. primary school. I'll send you a pair and just try them. <laughs> just try them, and I guarantee you won't go More back. More comfortable than so the. A few of the, the boys at the club, yeah, a few of the boys at the club only wear trunks. I've yeah. gone, look, just try the briefs. I yeah. guarantee you'll love them. Maybe we're more tired. Really? Yeah. Change the thing. Oh, it's funny because yeah, I went to the time I've gone, oh, how embarrassing this. I'm wearing Bokey's <laughs> undies before we even record this. It's uh, meant to be, mate. Meant <laughs> to be. So. Um, mate, there's one thing I wanted to to share with you that uh, a couple of months ago, and that when um, Russell Ebert had passed, I had to do an interview with Brett Ebert, and he told me, I think, one of the nicest compliments about you that I thought was remarkable. And he said that uh, a couple of months ago when you guys played Hawthorne, there was the Russell Ebert tribute game. Yep. And he said he was talking to the group before the match or I think during training that week. And he said, I looked around the group and I saw Bokey and I looked at Bokey and I said, he reminds me of the modern day Russell Ebert. And Brett said that yeah. about his dad <clears throat> and you. And when he's told that to the hairs went up on the back of my neck and I went, that could be as nice a compliment oh. as I think I've ever heard someone say about someone else. Yeah, that's incredible. When I heard that, it was, yeah, I was kind of speechless in a way. Is Russ was just an incredible human, and you know, we talk about, you know, being a good human first and great athlete second. He was the mm. ultimate, mm. the ultimate of that before his time. You know, it was always being about a good, a good human first, and yeah. and that continued on. You know, post footy with the stuff that he did at the footy club. You know, he was straight into the community, yeah. helping out, and wherever you went in the community and yeah. you know because we when we come into the club we do a cyp group cyp yep. program which goes out at the schools and stuff and everywhere you go where's russ where's russ where's russ mm -hmm. and, and that's just the person that he was everyone loved him i don't reckon there was a, a one person yeah. in i mean in australia mm -hmm. probably but in south mm -hmm. australia would would say a bad word about mm -hmm. him and you know that's the whole hey we're a human being first mm -hmm. human doing second mm -hmm. you know and he was the uh he was the ultimate at that well, what I love is not just someone recognised that in you, his son yes. recognised that in you, who's special. obviously one of your teammates yeah. when you're playing. No, very special to, to hear that. And yeah, Brett's a good man. So You said now that you feel so much younger, how much longer have you got in you? 34? You, could you get to 400? Well, I'd love to get to 400, but I honestly don't have a um, number that I'd... Yeah. Like it, right now, I mean, the games are just a number. Like, yeah. uh, it doesn't... For me, it's about enjoying it, making the most of it, and mm. still trying to reach my potential, which I feel like I've got more to go. Yeah. So my mind and my body, I still love the game. Yeah. Um, I still love the footy club, and I'm yep. still really excited to train and get better. So at this stage, I'd, I'm happy to keep going for as long as I so can. So you contracted for next year? Not yet. So we're going through. Right. We'll go through contract talk. Right. Now. Would you like to break your contract deal on here and just say that you're going to sign and everything's good? <laughs> Give can five we get year. an exclusive on here? I can don't I get a five-year deal? I want yeah. a five-year deal. Mate, <laughs> <laughs> I tell you what, just get everyone, Chris Davies, your footy manager, to have a listen yep. to this. And if he understands, and he, I'm sure he does, your mindset and how you're still young and you're like Benjamin Button getting younger, I think we could – who got an eight-year deal, a seven-year deal for – was it Oliver, Oliver, Oliver. Yeah. Clayton Oliver got it not long ago. Could, do you reckon we can get you to sign to 42? <laughs> I reckon. Maybe, you surely. 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 Um, <laughs> doesn't yeah. have to be as much money as Oliver's on. <laughs> I, I get the feeling you do it for free almost. <laughs> not quite. No, I'm still going to pay my house. Don't – um, so. yeah, mate, that's um, – it's something still though. You, you reckon there's a couple of years there for sure? Yeah. Well, I mean, in my eyes, you know, three or four uh, mm. for sure. As much as I still love the game and as much as I still want to continue to get better, yeah. then I I want to stay in the game. And then, you know, post that will be about transitioning into helping others yep. become the best they can be, you know. So what's In footy that is. or? Yeah. I, like I, I'd love to do it in life as well. Yeah. Um, but footy. If we can do it, it's kind of both at the same time. It'd be well, amazing. You, you but I'd love to stay in. Yeah, well, I'd love if to. If you're stay doing it in footy, footy, you're doing it. You're setting up the it's lives the of these young guys and now girls. Playing. Yeah, yeah. Well, exactly. It's the same message within footy as it is in life. Yeah. You know, it would just change a little bit in footy, where you know, hopefully, I can help around some structure stuff, midfield, all that kind of stuff. Yeah. But it's still the same message. Yeah. Um. You know, if we if yeah. we go into what we do as a good human being and yes. and worry about that first and yeah. just let the doing take care of itself, it doesn't matter what you do, whether it's footy or being a um, you know, a good brother or a good son or a good yeah. dad, it's all the same message. Yeah. For anyone listening in now and they've listened to your journey, what's your advice Ooh. to someone who 
might not be feeling great, might not be feeling happy. You've been through such a challenging situation. If someone's just, you know, life's just shit at the moment. Yeah. What would you say to someone like that? The first thing I would say would, would be to talk to someone. Yeah. You know, I think that's the hardest part too. I think a lot of us feel like now nah, we'll be right. Mm. Whether you're female, whether you're male, it doesn't matter. If 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 there's something there that you're like, that you don't feel great, then mm. there's something that you need to talk about. Mm. And it is the best thing you can possibly do. One, it takes away the shame that you may feel because you've just shared with someone and generally the person that you feel comfortable enough sharing with will give you empathy, yeah. which then it's like, oh, okay, so I can actually feel this way. Yeah. And then you're already on, you're off, off to a huge start because then you can start sharing yes. more and more. But you take away that shame straight away by sharing with someone. You share your story with me yep. and I share empathy back. Yeah. You know, you've already automatic connection with someone. I like, oh, okay. So it's okay. Yeah, yeah, you know yeah. what I mean? So yes. whatever it is, you know, you are going through that it's okay to, to feel like that. Yeah. And I think, you know, being able to share with someone and go talk to someone about it, yeah. whether it's, you know, a, a parent, a friend, um, family member or psychologist, whoever yep. it is, someone you really, really trust. Mm. I think that's the most important thing. And I think from there, it's about understanding your story. Yep. But that can't start without you talking to someone, mm. I don't think. Yeah. So that's that would be my advice. That's kind of where it all started for me. And what was the line from Ben Crow? It's okay to be you. That's it, isn't it? It's okay to be you. I've got some like uh, markers at, at home and I just write on my mirror in my bathroom and I've just got, I'm enough, I'm worthy. <laughs> It's okay to be me. Yeah. Just to remind me every day, you know, and we sort of talked about before, you know, what do I do now? Yeah. A lot of journaling, you know, I've got a gratitude journal that I write in every day, mm. what I'm grateful for in the morning, what I'm grateful for at night, how my day went, what am I proud of, what are my lessons? Mm. And then just write down some stuff that I might be thinking. Mm. And, you know, that helps a lot as well. Um, but I've got people that I, I try to talk to, you know, every every fortnight or whatever. Yep. But, you know, little, what would you call them, like little mottos or headlines mm. that, that yeah. resonate with you. You know, yes. it might be good for me. It might not yep. connect as much with you, but mm -hmm. little things that just go, ah, cool. Well, imagine it's if okay. you're doing it every day and especially if you, you've had such negative self-talk for so many yeah. years, you've got to rewire a hell of you a do. lot of networks and pathways that you've you've you know, cut into your head. Yeah. You've got to rewire the whole lot. Totally. Well, it's just training, isn't it? Like anything, yeah. you know, you begin to train, you go to the gym and you train your arms for yes. <laughs> six months, you're going to get bigger arms. Yeah. But you train your mind from negative to positive self-talk. Eventually you start getting some good results, yeah. but it's just continued practice and being kind yeah. to yourself. Yes. You know, we're all so hard on ourselves, but not hard on anyone else. Yeah. We're the hardest on ourselves. Self-compassion. Oh, mate, I could, the way that I've talked to myself over the years, you wouldn't talk to your worst enemy like that. No. Nah. You couldn't. No, nah, you wouldn't have. But you can quite easily, the That's most crazy. important person in your life who is yourself, yep. you can comfortably do it and not just do it now and then, like just continuously do it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> no, exactly right. And I think the more you then understand that, the more you understand others, right? Mm. So you may in the past seen someone snap or someone do something rude to you and you're like rude straight back yeah but you change your mindset and how you see the world and how you see yourself you automatically would change your response to that person oh they might be going through something hey are you okay yeah bang it's already a different conversation right yeah. and then that might then change their world for the day i think the more we can we can do that yeah. we're, we're living in a better place bokey you are a wonderful man mate and i know that you're a great footballer but you talked about being a great person first. I think uh, as good as you are a footballer, I think you're a better bloke than you are a footballer. <laughs> and that's not meant to be an insult in any way. <laughs> <laughs> no, I appreciate it, mate. Well, hopefully that, that'll make dad proud because that was, uh, you know, everything I learned from him. So, yeah, that's uh, always human being first, football second. Well, mate, I would never try and talk for your family or for your dad or anything, but I could tell you right now that there is no doubt that your dad and clearly your mum and everyone could be nothing but proud of you, mate. And I'm... Um, I feel a bit, I feel very, very grateful that you have shared this and you, you have that ability to open up and be vulnerable because I think there is enormous strength in vulnerability, not weakness. And I think, mate, you're the poster child for that. I oh, appreciate it, mate. Thanks for thanks for having me on here. It's great. It's been great to chat. But as you said, mate, vulnerability is the key to, mm. to everything, being open and taking that mask off. Here's to 400 games and becoming a dad. Let's hope so. Let's hope so. We'll have a beer on next time. Beautiful. Beautiful.
Well, guys, thanks so much for listening. Now, if you love what you just heard, please subscribe to the Soda Room podcast. You could write a review. Uh, you can watch the show on YouTube and share it with your buddies. And if you'd like to get in touch with the show, drop us a line, info at thesodaroom.com. Catch you soon.